This is We the Sales Engineers Podcast, show 213. Welcome to We the SES Podcast, the show for sales engineers by sales engineers with your host, Ramsey Majaba. What's up, SE Nation? How are you doing today? This is show 213 of the We the Sales Engineers Podcast, and I have, I think, and I don't want to create a negative reputation or any reputation whatsoever, but I think I have the most positive person most optimistic person I've ever had on this podcast. And she goes by the name of Amber Fallon. It was just a joy to talk to Amber. Now we talked about a lot of different stuff from finding the right role for you. Not all sales engineering is the same. And if you're doing software development, it's the same almost everywhere. Sales engineering is different. Sometimes you have short sales cycles. Sometimes you have long sales cycles. Sometimes you are, there to in a pool model sometimes you're supporting one account manager sometimes you're supporting 10 account managers so we talk about how she went through her i guess finding the right job for her finding the role the right role for her so and you know it, it was just a joy to talk to her and we talked about a lot more now the unfortunate thing is um i think either my internet or her internet wasn't working towards the end so the not so fire on was a bit choppy and I decided to spare you the pain of, you know, listening to choppy audio. So we're just, I'm going to cut that part out and hopefully you guys are okay with it. And if you really enjoy the show and you have any questions that you want to ask Amber herself, I'll invite her to the show again and we'll do the not so fire on at that point in time. So that's it. Thank you guys for being here and I'll see you after. Good afternoon, Amber. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you, Ramsey? I am doing very well. I always have to check if it's afternoon or night or because it's a connected world these days. It's, we can no longer check. You are West Coast, right? East Coast. I am, I'm in Boston. Oh, there you go. Good afternoon. Anyways, it worked out. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I am doing well. Thank you for coming on. I am very curious about your story. So maybe we can start from the day you were born or just wherever you want to start. Okay, uh, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. Um, I'm, I'm a military brat, the, the daughter of a, a military scientist and a veterinarian. So I grew up kind of surrounded by tech and it was always a big interest of mine. Um, life happened, things went on and I lucked into my first sales engineering position in 2015. Um, and that has really been eye-opening to me. It feels almost like I won the lottery. It is the perfect combination of technical skills, the ability to teach and train and explain things, but also relating to people, being able to present things, being able to share knowledge. It's like the nexus of everything I enjoy in one job. So um, I've bounced around to a couple different companies. I've, I've tried a few different industries to find out where I'm, I'm most happy and comfortable. And um, I, I love being a sales engineer and I see that being my career for the long term. How do you find, how do you define happy and comfortable? Like when you're looking for a job, you, like you move a couple of roles. How do you know you're happy? Because, you know, we always think that things could be better. Sure. Um, I like the the people that I work with. It, it's super important to me to work with a team, especially a team of salespeople that I support, that I get along with, that I trust, um, that I respect. That's super important to me. Having leadership that is accountable, honest, and committed to the happiness and the success of their team and their product. That's super important to me as well. And having an industry that I can relate to is really important to me. If I don't believe in something, I can't sell something. So I couldn't be an effective sales engineer for a product product I would never use or never have any relationship or experience with. Okay. Uh, you mentioned happy a few times. Uh, I think you, we have a, a common connection in Aileen McNabb, right? Yes. Yeah. So she always talks about happiness specifically. And it's interesting, like not, not many managers care. Well, they care if their SEs are content. I'm not sure they care about their, ha if they're happy in their role. So throughout, like, what made you move from one company to another? Were you content? Were you not? Like, was something pushed you out or were you just looking for something better? Um, 
I left my first sales engineering role because the company wasn't really meeting my needs and I was looking for more growth opportunities that were there. I also really wanted to dip my toes into a couple of different industries and find out where I was going to be happiest, where I was going to like supporting the team, somewhere that had a sales cycle that worked for me. I mean, I personally am not a huge fan of really long sales cycles and I've supported sales cycles that have been 18 months before. And it just, it just doesn't feel like you have momentum and it's really, really hard to stay enthused and engaged for an 18 month sales cycle. So a shorter sales cycle uh, was definitely something I was looking for. Um, I tried out marketing technology and there were some things I liked about it. Uh, I really loved the company that I landed with, Insight Squared. Unfortunately, due to COVID, there were a lot of layoffs, and I was I was unfortunately a part of that. Um, then I moved to a company called Examiny, and it was great, uh, but I really missed the marketing technology space. I, I just felt like that language and the, the customers and the prospects were just so much more where I was comfortable speaking to. And education just really didn't resonate with me quite as much. I mean, it's a fantastic industry and there's so much growth there, especially over COVID, which was why it was really appealing because that was, virtual um, proctoring was in high demand at the, the real start of COVID and, and throughout that period. But I missed marketing. Uh, so I came to a company called Ometria uh, Marketing Automation, uh, CDMP or Customer Data Marketing Platform, which is what we are formally. Um, I'm back to being able to speak to marketers and talk about analytics and information and automation. Uh, and I think that's that's really the, the core of what makes me personally happy. Customers that I can relate to, stories that I can tell and interweave and have a personal connection to, um, and an industry that supports that. So I'm looking at your history on LinkedIn. Um, so you started off in IT, is that right? Yes. So you started off in IT, you tried marketing technology, then you tried education and like not teaching, but education market, I guess. And now you're back to the mar uh, marketing technology. Yes, back to marketing technology. Okay. Um, all right. So you've tried your hand in a few, uh, in a few roles. How did you... A lot of times when we move from one industry to another, it's like, oh, you don't know the technology, you don't know the industry and all that. How were you able to get uh, the F Insight Squared, right? That's the first company that you worked in marketing technology. Yes. Moving away from IT. How were you able to convince them that you're a good risk to take uh, when you didn't know the industry? Sure. Um, when I first stumbled upon their product, I really liked it. It resonated a lot with me because there was a business analytics side of it. Revenue ops was really just taking off. It was really something that a lot of companies hadn't adopted yet. And it was really exciting. So I approached the interview process from that standpoint of I can sell this product because I would personally like to use this product. Having more insight into forecasting and that what's likely to drive my sales goals is just really really awesome and exciting and a great thing to have. And if I can, if I want to use it, I can sell it. And that's very much how I approached Inside Squared. Okay. Well, um, that's, that's good. Uh, what's the difference between the customers from like marketing technology versus IT? You mentioned uh, you preferred working with uh, marketing people, I guess. What was the difference and like, why was it better or easier or preferable for you? Sure. Um, the IT space is great. I mean, it's a lot of really awesome, really creative people, but it tends to be very, very focused on very specific areas. So you have to be a jack of all trades, especially when you're supporting a wide array of products. And it can be tricky in order to know enough about enough different things that you can confidently speak to a number of different individuals. That can be a tricky thing in and of itself. And the ability to walk the walk, uh, it's, it's something that's really important as a sales engineer. If you're going to put yourself in a position where you're talking to somebody about their day-to-day -day activities and how your tool can really help them and make their lives easier or better or faster or more efficient, you really need to be able to speak to a place of understanding. I need to be able to, to convince prospects that I know what their job is, what they're doing, and what they're going through. And I've never been a developer. I can write code, I've done it before, I do it sometimes. Uh, I actually uh, made a, a video game for my husband for our 10 year anniversary, um, but it's, 
it's not my favorite area. Whereas I do, I am, I am the best consumer in the world. You can ask my husband um, if something says new or limited edition on it. I, I'm, I get tons of marketing emails. I read a lot of things. I pay a lot of attention to what sells and what doesn't and trends in, in places. So it's really easy for me to speak to marketers from that place of understanding. What they're trying to achieve is exactly what I, I am somebody who's going to be engaged with their brand, somebody who's going to be a big cheerleader for their company, that's the ideal. Somebody who's going to share their, their messages, retweet or share on Facebook, Instagram, somebody who is going to buy products, encourage other people to buy products. So, you know, basically me in a nutshell. So I'm, what I'm hearing is not that you prefer working with marketing versus IT, it's just your passion seems to be marketing. Like the way you're talking about it, you seem to love it so yeah it's good that you found your passion which is something a lot of people struggle with uh i know but you know when, when if you want to be an se you can always combine that with your with your passion and your your kind of proof of that and another thing you mentioned was uh like short sales cycles versus long sales cycles uh, when you say long sales cycles i think government for some reason uh yeah, having having gone through some, some procurement processes for, for government entities, yeah, they're up there. Also, a lot of the enterprise customers I've worked with before tend to have much larger sales cycles. They'll have more stakeholders. It'll be a more involved process. There'll be a full RFP process. Um, sometimes pre-COVID, of course, they'll even want to fly you out to their site multiple times to uh, present to various different groups of people. It tends to be very involved. Okay, so... When, when when I think of long sales cycle, I feel like the SE does a couple of things, a couple of presentations, you fly out a couple of times, and then your job is done. And now it's on the salesperson to keep following up. And I'm mainly saying that because I don't really have very long uh, sales cycles. So um, that's my thought process. W am I off in that? Like, What is the role of an SE in a prolonged sales cycle? Sure. In a prolonged sales cycle, one of the things that I don't want to say I struggled with, but definitely didn't hit that passion zone for me was long, long POCs. Um, basically going through a full implementation with somebody and training them on using the product, going through a bunch of different use cases with them. And then there would be somebody inevitably over a sales cycle that long leaving, and then you'd have to go through the process again, um, multiple different presentations to different stakeholders saying essentially the same thing with the same use case again and again and again. It got very repetitive. Yeah. I, I, I remember I worked in post sales. I think I just told that to somebody, can't remember who, but I, I was in a, like network design and we sold designs to the government uh, for networking equipment uh, for a couple of counties. And it would take like a year and a half to implement. And then they'd come back and say, well, it's been a year and a half and now you have all these new features. We want them added to the design of whatever you just did. So. And we're like, but you didn't pay for that. So that, that always was a point of contention for me. Like a lot can change in a year and a half. Um, so th that's an interesting, how did you deal with like changes and? Um, well, yeah. as positively as possible. Um, if there's one thing I, I like to say about myself, it's that I'm a force for, for relentless positivity. I try to find the, the bright spot in, in whatever it is. Um, my goal in life is to make whatever situation, circumstance, or place that I happen to be in better than it was before I got there. And I try to apply that philosophy to constant change, um, whether that is we have made a change in the product, or we need you to make a change in the product, or brand new use case, or completely redoing the POC, all of that you can kind of spin as it's experience. Um, you're helping somebody out. You're helping your sales team, just finding the silver lining and kind of clinging onto that sometimes, even when it's really, really thin on the edge of that cloud, sometimes you just got to cling to it. So like, what's the line where okay, you're positive and you're happy to help versus, okay, now it's time for you to buy because we've done this five times. <laughs> Was, is there a line or we just keep supporting the customer whenever they ask for stuff? My goal is to support the salesperson and the sales cycle. So I will leave that to them. And if they want to push back, I will support them in that. And if they want me to keep on, and then I will do that. Um, I don't believe there's ever been a situation where 
I have made that call um, because it's not really my job. It's somebody else's commission on the line. And I look at myself as the, the sales team sidekick. You know, I, I'm the Robin to their Batman. They get to make the call at the end of the day because it's Commissioner Gordon who's going to be calling them, not me. Well, you're, you're much more positive than I am. I would have like thrown a fit at some point. Uh, <laughs> the sales guy and I would have had a conversation or the sales. I've only worked with sales guys, so that's all I can say. So, all right. And so now that you're in um, like your marketing technology and you're happy, actually, why are you happy other than you're working in marketing technology? Uh, sure. Um, I work for a really great company and it's really the nexus of everything that I really need to be fulfilled in my career. I have a phenomenal team. Um, my manager and the other sales and in our organization are super awesome. I love working with them. We have great conversations every day and I find that really personally fulfilling. Uh, my position is fully remote as well, which is also really nice because I used to commute into downtown Boston and it's kind of a nightmare. <laughs> it, it's a lot of traffic and a lot of stop and go and Boston is full of one way streets and, and closed roads all the time. So I'm, I'm really glad to have that off my, my shoulders. One thing that the sort of chaotic stress nightmare of early COVID taught me was having 90 minutes a day, sometimes two hours a day back in my life uh, was a huge difference. I had time to cook. I had more time to spend with my husband and our dogs. I was just a happier person, even despite the stress and uncertainty of COVID. So that's something that was very important to me as well, being able to have that kind of flexibility where, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy and fulfilled. I'm still working, but that commute is no longer part of my, my work stress. Um, and the fact that our product is awesome. Uh, what we're doing, um, our, our elevator pitch is helping retailers create marketing experiences their customers will love. And I just love that because number one, it's super positive, um, but I'm one of those customers and I like marketing experiences that I love. I like getting good targeted personalized messages that are relevant to me and helping people do that for more people is just, it's awesome. Nice. So I, I used to use like the drive from and to work as like time to switch from a Ramsey the SE to Ramsey the husband and father. And now that's gone, do you feel like the need to kind of, is there pressure where you're working, 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 and now you're home? Was there any positives to that the commute or like for you, it's never been a problem where it's I am very lucky in the sense that I have my own office. Um, so it's really easy for me to close the door when I'm done working and just kind of shut off. I turn off work Amber um, when I'm done for the day and I turn off notifications on Slack on my phone and my email. Um, so I, I do have that ability to step away. And I, I was lucky in that um, Eileen, actually, I, I've worked with her before as a coach and she does a phenomenal job, but she did talk about work-life balance and making sure that you don't get too absorbed um, in and lose yourself in work and how easy it is to do. So setting clear boundaries very early on uh, really helped with that process. And I, I'm lucky enough that I can kind of flip the switch a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's something I've been struggling with because uh, I do have three kids. So when I walk up, like I have my own office in the basement. Otherwise, I would never be able to do a podcast. Uh, I would walk up and the first thing they do is just run straight into my stomach. And like, I'm still, I, I need to figure out how to like not go up before I switch out because I'm expecting to have that time to switch. I guess that's something I need to work on. Yeah, find uh, a ritual, I'm find something that you do at the end of every day that just really does it. For me, I have a calendar on the back of my door to my office and I make sort of a check mark on that day. And then that sort of closes the book on the day for me. And okay. I find it really, it's that's really good. very helpful. Just have a small ritual and that's what you do. And that's what ends the work day. It's better than getting run into. Like have to do something before. Yeah, that's good. Uh, okay. So right now, like, are there, you seem so happy and I'm not, I am kind of, uh, I would say I'm a pessimist realist <laughs> and I am, I really want to know, is there something that's challenging for you today? And to that things that are, you're fighting that are trying to make you unhappy that you're kind of fighting to stay optimist and uh, happy of. 
there are always challenges and it really depends on how you want to perceive them. I very fir firmly believe that for the most part, there's always outliers, but for the most part, you determine whether or not you're gonna be happy about something. And if you choose to take those challenges as negatives and you choose to let them stress you out, um, then you make the choice to stay in that situation or just let it make you miserable. Um, find where where you make what makes you happy, and if you're lucky enough to be able to switch careers, I know that's not something that everybody is able to do. Some people, you know, aren't in that position. Um, but find things to latch onto, find ways to make yourself happy, and find that find the bright spot. If you always look for the bright spot, that's what you're going to find. If you're always looking for the dark clouds, you're going to see more dark clouds, even if we're looking at the same picture. So I know that's that's kind of a weird analogy, but it, it has always kind of resonated with me. Um, there are always challenges, you know, uh, RFPs getting requests. You get the request for proposal last minute. It's due on Friday and it's 500 questions. Um, I, I will, I don't wanna be too negative here, but I did get one in a PowerPoint. I was sent an RFP in a PowerPoint. I'm not even kidding. They sent it in a PowerPoint and that is just mind boggling to me. And I'm 100% sure they did it as sort of a way to, is somebody really gonna take the effort to fill this out? They're just gonna ignore it unless they're really hungry for this deal. And of course I did it, but at the whole time I'm sitting there like copying and pasting everything and formatting it so that I could actually look at it and answer it logically from a PowerPoint. Um, so that was a, a thing that was a little challenging to find the bright spot in for an example well uh, i'm i'm happy to see that you're, you're human <laughs> so <laughs> i'm definitely human 100 percent. okay and uh you mentioned a few things like you have a great team your se manager is amazing what makes a team a great team because sometimes as as se's we're a bunch of individuals usually working on different things and we may or may not come together because depending on well especially with covid I don't, I don't see much of my teammates. What makes the team an amazing team? Sure. Um, a couple of things. So my overall philosophy is that sales engineer isn't just a job title. It's like a slider bar. So you're going to fall somewhere either closer to the sales side or closer to the engineer engineer side. Um, and that's fine. Everybody has different strengths and weaknesses. Some people be, may be more salesy, have more business acumen. Some people may be more technical. Um, you can work in those directions if that's something you want. But understanding that is huge to the success and happiness of the sales engineering organization, in my experience. Um, people who understand that people have different approaches. You know, not everybody's going to be a cookie cutter. People might present their demos in different ways. People might present product features or functionality in different ways. And as long as at the end of the day, the message gets across, that's what's important. Now, for my team in specific, uh, they're based in the UK, which is fun. Uh, we have a lot of really great discussions. I have learned so many interesting things um, about UK slang and culture and food and media. And it's just been awesome. Um, I generally really like them. So having meetings with them, I'm really excited to get to meet them in person is, is great. They were one of the reasons why I really chose this company. I was actually interviewing at another marketing company at the same time, but Ometria won out big time because of how much I really just liked Rob and Toby genu genuinely. Um, so that, that really helps as well. Um, but in general, I think that playing into your team's strengths and weaknesses and people who genuinely want to make whatever the goal is better. I mean, that's more than just my team. That's one of the things I really love about Ometria is everybody is rowing in the same direction. There are no egos here and everybody wants to make things better. They want to make things work. They want to make whatever the goal is and having a bunch of people who you know are rowing the same direction at your back is just so empowering. So is all your team in the UK? Is there anybody else in the North America? There are a few. Um, I have a fantastic sales team. They are based in New York City. Uh, we've met a couple times, but due to COVID and, and now Omicron, so we haven't gotten to see each other recently. Um, but there is a great team. They're spread out across uh, the US. I think there are 15 of us in the United States now, um, and we're going to be growing. Ometri is doing fantastic things, and we're just going to keep increasing our numbers here. So like other SEs or just uh, like sales, sales. Or everybody? Okay. Uh, we've got a couple different, we've got sales, we've got partnerships. Um, we've got somebody in people on the people team as well. I, I um, love that. Okay. I, I love that when I ask like about the team in my mind, I'm thinking sales engineering team, cause that's the team. 
but you're thinking like, oh, the whole the whole company is my team. They're all my so, team. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you cover you cover basically North America pretty much on your own as a sales engineer. Is that accurate? For the time being, yes. I'm hoping okay. that will change in the in the future as demand c- continues. Uh, right now, the AE to SE ratio is pretty good here. There are two full time AEs and me, so we're we're great. We get to be pretty tight knit. We get to have frequent conversations, and um, I can really key in on their deals. Um, but I think if we increase our AE capacity, we'd probably be looking at another sales engineer sometime in the future. Okay. And have you worked with like a different ratio in the past where you're one to four or one to five? Um, yes, I actually at the worst was one to 20. It was one of the most challenging things I've ever done was it was me. I was the only sales engineer with a company of 20. I think it was actually 21 salespeople. It was yeah, a, after 20. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, it was. Um, it was a challenge. You asked about challenges before. That was that was the big one. How did you deal with it? I did what I could to be as efficient as possible. Uh, we looked into a variety of tools to try and help me with that. Um, demo enablement platforms were super high on my list of priorities. Um, I also made sure that I put very strict banding requirements on my time. I had to. So I had to say, I will only get involved in a deal if it's worth X dollars, because there just wasn't enough of me to go around. I also did a lot of recording, very short snippets of certain features and functionalities that could be then sent out to lower uh, dollar prospects so that they were still getting some information without being able to go through the full demo experience Um, and pacing myself as much as possible, guarding my calendar like a lion. (laughs) Yeah, like the question comes up, so when did you have time to do those recordings and look at the automation platforms? Like, I would imagine you're just a chicken uh, with the, your head cut off trying to support 21 salespeople. So that's impressive in my humble opinion. Which if it you was a big challenge. It, it was a big challenge. And I did my best <laughs> to deliver as much value as I could. You're just such a positive person. It is a big challenge. Like I would have said it sucks, but all right, it's a, <laughs> it's a positive spin to it. I was never bored. I can say during my entire time there, I was never, ever bored. Were you frustrated? Like, why why wouldn't you have looked elsewhere? Or did you think that this was a, this was a great place to be and there's um, potential? Init- I did eventually end up looking for a new position. Uh, at, at the time, it was really great to have the job security. Um, right. I had been laid off, so that that definitely rocks your world a little bit and t- changes the the nature of feeling secure in your position. Right. Um, so I, the job secured plus, um, and the team was the, the team of AEs that I worked with, although it was a huge team, they were really really great. On top of their game, smart, knowledgeable, a lot of them were able to do demos themselves, at least the initial demo. So that took a lot off my plate as well. Okay, that's good. Lovely. You survived. I I, like I've been, I've been talking to people, like, uh, and they've had bad experiences. But it's kind of like what you said: even a bad experience could be a good experience. It's experience. You just learn yeah. about what you like and what you don't like. So exactly. next time you go and interview for a position, what's the AE to SE ratio? That's the question that comes up, right? So Absolutely. That was one of the first questions I asked everybody I talked to when I was looking for a new role. And like, what is the ratio like? Okay. And is that your ideal ratio or did you want that to be a little different? Because when you're talking to somebody and they, they've got a huge SE team, that's great. What is your ideal ratio? That's an important question to ask as well, because if you're going to hire another 50 AEs over the next year, um, are you hiring enough ACs to keep that ratio low as well? What do you think is the best ratio for SEs? I think it depends a little bit on the the product and the nature of the sale itself, but I would say no more than five or six. I think that it's really important to be a a good tight-knit team. A good solid AE and SE relationship relies on being able to take the ball and run with it, um, being able to, you know, make jokes and have them compliment the joke or finish the joke, knock the punchline out of the park, Um, being able to play off of each other, having a good rapport and understanding of the way they sell and how you can enhance that. And when you have a ratio that's bigger than I'd say six, 
it gets really hard. Everybody has a different sales style. Some people are really energetic and dynamic. Some people are a little bit more subdued. Some are right there asking the qualifications and in your face. Some have a lot more of a comfortable cadence and let's get to know each other. And it can be a really big challenge trying to flip that switch. That's probably the biggest challenge that I had working with such a diverse and vast group of AEs was being able to cater myself to their style quickly. I would jump off a call with one AE who was super analytical, super focused, very, very technical. And then I jump into one who was friendlier and more easygoing and conversational. And it was making sure that I could complement them efficiently was probably the biggest challenge I faced. It's interesting. So I, I've, all, I've only been tied one-to-one -one, and even for the last, I don't know how long, I've been my own salesperson. So I work with myself very well. Let's put it that way. Um, Important. Yeah. Uh, but I imagine when the team gets like, when there's one to six uh, ratio or one to seven, one to, one to 10, the SE stops being like a consultative person and becomes more of a account manager support where you're just jumping on demos, answering technical questions whenever they come. So you're less consultative with the customer and you're just there to support the account manager. But a lot of the things that you said, like uh, basically putting a limit on the, like, I won't work on anything less than X amount and creating these videos is, is to basically be more of a consultative person than to help on the strategic uh, opportunities, which is interesting. I love the ability to be strategic when I can. I mean, I'm pretty experienced. I've been around this block for going on almost eight years. So I've seen a lot of different successes and I've seen a lot of different things that could have gone better. And I really believe that I can, I can be objective in a way that sometimes salespeople can't. You know, everybody wants that white whale deal. Everybody wants yeah. to jump over that rainbow and they want to land that big ticket. Everybody's heard of them. Um, but I've seen that lead to missed quotas. I've seen it lead to frustration. I've seen it lead to, you know, some unpleasant situations. And it's a lot easier for me to be objective. You know, I heard somebody once say that AEs eat well, SEs sleep well. Um, and as true as I think that is, I also think that the importance there is because I am not tied to that number, because I'm not exactly on a, a objective, but I'm not, that number doesn't make or break me. I can yeah. be more objective about it. I can, I can have that honest heart to heart with my AE and I can say, look, I know that everybody knows this brand and that you would love to get that logo. But at the end of the day, I don't think this deal is going to close and here's why. You know, there, there was going around for a while, it's been less uh, at Ometria, so probably the industry, but for a while, there were a lot of um, big, big names, especially when I worked in the IT space, that would RFP vendors they knew were never going to be successful. They'd pick the one they wanted, and then they'd pick a couple of smaller little nobodies or companies they knew wouldn't fit the need because they wanted to make theirs look good. And it was really, really hard. Yeah, it was hard. To say. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was really hard to say, you know, I really don't believe we have a shot at this. So don't give it 100% of your effort because I don't think it's going to close. Oh. So uh, I think the author of Solution Selling, he actually said, like, if you're a column fodder, just pull out. Like, yeah. don't go yeah. through with it. It's not, even, don't, it's not even don't give them 100%. Just say no. When you're serious about it, we can come and talk. But yeah, for agreed. now, if no, you're gonna fail, it's very fail hard. As possible. It, it can be. It can be really hard. I mean, I've been super excited about deals. I, as I mentioned, I'm a great consumer. So when I see a brand that I personally like, and you know they're in front of me, I get super excited because I'm like, it would be awesome to work with you. I love your product. But at the end of the day, if we're not a good fit, we shouldn't be a good fit. Um, Andy White from Medic, if you're familiar with him at all, uh, says no one ever regrets qualifying out. And he is 100% right. Um, if, if it's not a good fit, let's nip it in the bud. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole point of qualification. I guess he shouldn't get involved in a lot of different deals that like it's not even qualified, but it is what it is. And you know, It is, we'll, we'll, and we're there to support the sales team and one of the interesting things about being an SE is how open people will be with me 
when they won't be with my AE. It's funny. Um, one of my favorite, like most memorable sales engineering experiences was I was working with a, an AE I had a great relationship with. He pulls me in on a call and he tells me beforehand, he's like, you know, what I really want, I want to know what their budget is. They've been really tight lipped about this. I've been trying to get it out of them for ages. So, you know, if you can do your magic and figure out a way. So we hop on this call. It's the fifth or sixth call he's had with this prospect. And the first thing I say is, hey, so what are we looking at for budget? And they just give me a number. And he literally stands up, rips his headset off and says, how could you do that? And I was like, a magic I just did it. No, um, it's funny that because the, the technical is usually before sales engineer or because maybe the engineers at the end, um, there is a different perception. I'm still trying to sell you something, uh, but you know, if you're going to tell me more than you'll tell the AE, sure, I'll, I'll be willing to, to ask you the question. Well, it's uh, like uh, the budget question is kind of an interesting one because a lot of times they say SE shouldn't ask about budget. But the solution that we're coming up with, we can come up with like a trillion dollar solution for whatever problem you have. But if we don't know your budget, like if you tell us your budget, we can try to fit within it. We can offer you a solution that would fit within it. And that's why I've asked that question in the past when my AE doesn't ask or wants me to ask. But in general, a lot, a lot of books say like, hey, when they start talking about money, you shut up as an SE. So. I can understand that for to an extent. Um, I deliberately try to stay away from anything involving pricing or quoting. I will flat out tell anybody who asks me, I'm sorry, I'm not the I'm not the numbers person. Um, I'm the techie. So if you want numbers, I'll get the AE to talk to you um, because I don't want to misquote something. And it's not really my place to negotiate. Going back yeah. to what we said earlier about, you know, SEs sleep better, mm -hmm. eat, eat better. It's not my name on that quota. So I don't want to reduce the cost of the deal. Um, when it's not me who's writing on it. But I do think that budget is an important thing to talk about, uh, especially at a company if there are professional services involved. That is a very important thing for, for SEs to be involved in because scoping out, you know, if it's going to be 80 hours of professional services at $100 an hour, that's a big commitment. And, and this BAE might not be aware of that. Yeah. And asking for budget is different than giving them prices. Yeah. Like we're very asking them for like the money. And then we can go back and look at, like, I don't know the pricing, but I can go back and work with my AE on a proposal for you that fits your needs uh, if we can. And that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you, Amber, for coming on. Thank you for your positive attitude and the way you positively think about things. I just re-listened to the show. We recorded it a while back and I had to re-listen to it. And I don't know, I felt positive about my day to day, just listening to your positivity. You went through some challenges, but you came out better and you're, you've been positive about it the entire time. So that was great. And one thing she mentioned was that she, one thing Amber mentioned was that she worked with a coach, Aileen McNabb, one of the best coaches I've seen about sales engineering. Well, that's not nice. Anyways, uh, so if you are looking for help, find a coach, whether it's Aileen, which, who I highly recommend, or myself, Patrick was saying, there's a lot of coaches out there that are there to help you. So find a coach, because as you noticed, they talk not necessarily about only sales engineering. They did talk about other things such as work-life balance. So find a coach, check out the SE hotline, check out Amy McNabb, Patrick was saying, find someone to actually talk to. Because I think that will take you next step or a little bit further in your career than going to the loan. That's my final word for today. With that, I am signing off.